Professor Cruz says that we must proceed. So let's go ahead with Professor Clotilde Vasquez, which is also my friend. She also introduced a very beautiful book lately. She will speak on the last part. The complications of diabetes and the two new drug families. You can share your experience with that. Go ahead, Clotilde. Thank you for counting on me. Deep down, I'm a clinician among so many scientists. But I'll start with Dr. Barrios ended concerning SGLT2s. I'm going to shift quickly. Let's see if I can see the first slides. I would like to pick up where he had left off because yesterday was the World Diabetes Day. Not long ago, we heard of the study on heart failure. And these groups of drugs that showed up, first of all, the GPLT1 analogs in which in the saliva of an Arizona lizard, we were so joyful in the treatment of such a complex disease, phenotypically different, a systemic disease that has an increase in mortality and morbidity, which is type 2 diabetes. Wait, this is not my presentation. Clotilde Vasquez. There you go. I'm going to speak. And then I can go quickly here on the slides with such a strategic shift that they proposed. Several decades have gone along and we know that we have to look at diabetes from several points of view. And the goals of good control in diabetes have shifted throughout the years so that we have extended blood pressure, dyslipemia goals, more requisites to consider that a patient, a patient is well controlled, but still morbidity and um, mortality due to these kinds of diseases have not decreased. There was always a residual failure. Anyway, we have managed this with the new drugs that have come to help the management of the diabetic patient and the good control of what we call the cardiorenal metabolic system nowadays. So the SGLT2 inhibitors and the analogs have shown with maximum scientific evidence that they improve all of the outcomes that, of cardiovascular disease, ischemic cardiopathy, heart failure. We see the phenotypical um, demonstrations and also they would protect the kidney. It's very important to say that the most patients that are hospitalized in the dialysis units in developed countries are patients that have diabetes disorder, that is diabetes, or a metabolic syndrome with resistance to insulin. This has maximum evidence and has changed all the guidelines, recommendations for the treatment of diabetic patients. Many of you will know this. After metformin, which is holy metformin, is so useful for so many things, also for anti-aging. After the advent of metformin, facing any type 2 diabetes, almost, uh, patients, we think about 
the use of these families of drugs. So this cannot be questioned. But what happens with pre-diabetes? Pre-diabetes is such a frequent disease. There it is. Pre-diabetes, well, the diagnostic criteria are here. The prevalence doesn't stop increasing. In the United States, we calculate that one in every three people have pre-diabetes. But in China, in China, 50% of Chinese people, ladies and gentlemen, have pre-diabetes. And this is a silent toxic disease. It's a toxic cardiometabolic state increase that increases the risk, not as much as diabetes, but almost, because the same alterations that in diabetes are present. Here we can see the ominous uh, chart here that is present in prediabetes. It causes gastrointestinal dysfunctions, of course, due to the change in microbiota, also ophthalmological complications and neurological dysfunctions. Many dysfunctions of parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system and cardiovascular complications. In this meta-analysis, you can see the increase of the risk of being pre-diabetic to have any of the manifestations of MACE and cardiopathies. Here on the left, the highest risk of having strokes and mortality due to all causes has been shown in Juan's studies in 2016 due to having prediabetes. Of course, controlling for all other factors that also influence the meta-analysis. Thus, this situation of prediabetes, I believe, deserves much more attention. The American Diabetes Association has said so about a year ago. This toxic state can be reversed, and it's even more interesting and uh, incredible to tackle it. Of course, all these phenomena underpin the situation. So inflammation, increasing oxidative stress. They are so complex, but they underpin all of this. The pathophysiology of the pre-diabetic state is very complex. And uh, simply put, in a risky way, I wanted to sum up the fact that insulin resistance, apoglycemia, advanced glycation end products such as fibrosis of the extracellular tissue through inflammation and increase of oxidative stress can affect the endothelial fibrinolytic dysfunction and the endothelial vasodilator dysfunction. And of course, some microRNAs that are clearly known to influence these endothelial phenomena that are so important that underpin the pathology of prediabetes and diabetes. Many drugs, among them two new families, have an effect on oxidative stress and inflammatory phenomena. Here are the inhibitors of SGTL2 and the analogs of GLP-1. Which treatments do we have that have been well established nowadays that may reverse or improve prediabetes? Well, metformin, of course, carbosa, these agents that promise so much and then later on, unfortunately, due to uh, side effects, have not been used. But what's most interesting is the... Um, Next to last line, the use of dapaglifosin once daily and exenatide once weekly dual therapy produce a reversion uh, curing of 50% of people that are pre-diabetic and that use it. Liraglutide here in the scale study has shown that a 3 milligrams per day 
could cause an evolution with weight loss, a reduction of patients that ended up with diabetes. So liraglutide has been shown to be very useful in the treatment for prediabetes. Okay, I will end now. So what do I dare to say here? Assuming all of the knowledge that exists nowadays for diabetes treatment with these new drugs. The pre-diabetic state is an incubator of diabetes and all its comorbidities, cardiorenal ones, but of course, all the systemic uh, effects of the disease. And we need to detect the increase y de, tenemos que iluminar el foco para detectar el incremento This is the last piece of data we have. This is epidemiologically demonstrated, and everybody that worked in the hospital during the pandemic, in which all of these specialties had to work with COVID-19 patients, they all saw that the incidence was very high. Having obesity, being obese, increases in more than 40% the risk of infection, it increases in a 118, 13%, sorry, the risk of hospitalization for respirators failure, and also a 74% the possibility of ICU admission, and also a 48% of mortality risk. This has been demonstrated quickly, epidemically during this pandemic. Why is this related? We don't know. Seeking for some old data, we can see that there's a clear relation with the seasonal flu, but we do not know the reason. We doctors always see the effect on things before being able to study mechanisms. So the biggest risk this moment to be infected by COVID-19 is to be male over 65 and also being obese. But why? This is the question. We know that obesity increases the risk of inflammation. It has a disorder on the way our body works. And this is because the normal adipocyte, which is very fundamental, when there's an obesity, this Adipocyte tissue, it's converted into a pathogenic adipocyte, which we call an altered cellular metabolism of low level. And this is going to have a disorder, the defense on the pathogens that attack the organism. This is what we have been studying in our group. We have used three different studies the cetogenic diet, the low-calorie diet, and also the last one, which is very effective. This is a very important effect of this storm of cytokines we mentioned before. If you see the top chart, we could see that the patients with obesity have some levels of interferon, which are quite lower compared to the non-obese patients. This can justify the inflammatory problems. What we liked from our studies is that we did demonstrate that the loss, the weight loss, reestablishes the levels of interferon. Of course, the cetogenic diet is the most effective thing, but also the hypocaloric or the surgery. And when we did study other type of cytokines, that in this moment is the inter leukin, we can see on the right side that the obesity reduces this level, which is quite essential to generate the interferon. The biggest the obesity is the less levels of interferon. But when we 
lose weight, we do restart these levels of interference. We have studied a lot of cytokines, but this is a published work, work and I just wanted to bring here the fundamental issues. With this situation, with COVID and cytokines, the following thing that worried us is why obesity favors suffering COVID. You know that COVID, it's the angiotensin 2 and they are linked, and this goes into the cells. So we have used the epigenetic analysis that Esteller has beautifully described at the beginning, which is the alterations on the genome and the markers, the epigenetic markers that at a given point control the genome. So in this interest to know if somehow obesity could be deregulating the way of working of this. We did a study to see if the obese patients, this was altered. And what we found here is that on the left is the visceral tissue and on the right, the sub-skin, subcutaneous tissue. The darker the bar, the biggest the risk. So there's a very important alteration, a very important disorder on the obese people. It's interesting that we observe this in the visceral tissue and also in the periphery glycoside. This is very important. And maybe the most important or relevant thing to demonstrate this data is that we observe that the weight loss with any of the effects we can use, it re reverted the epigenome changes and levels. But the less appropriate one, it's the surgery. Why bariatric surgery does not revert this epigenome, we don't know. But bariatric surgery is the only system of lost weight related to a catabolic change in human being. Thank you very much for your attention and for being the moderators. Thank you very much, Felipe, for your presentation. And now, on the last knowledge, we need to go with this very the newest technology, and we want to have Laureano and Joanna. Can you listen to us? Bueno, mientras tanto presentaré a Joana Ferrer, es cirujana consultor del Hospital Clínic, responsable del trasplante de páncreas, y Laureano Fernández Cruz, es catedrático de mérito de cirugía del Hospital Clínic Universidad de Barcelona. Ahora es así. We were very happy to be here and introduce for you what the pancreas transplantation today. So it was started in 19. 66 in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. And that year, we did also study with the liver transplants and also pancreas transplant was just an adventure. They did 13 transplants in that year and they had some months of survival. The people that uh, were benefiting from this transplant had some kidney failures and they needed this pancreas transplant to avoid that this kidney suffered and to free the patients. This was a heroic moment, and now we are in a moment in which the pancreas transplant, it's a very important part of medicine, which is the standard of care considered, in which we have many candidates to a double transplant. Joanna Ferrer 
which is the responsible of pancreas transplant in the hospital clinic, University of Barcelona. She will do this presentation, and I think that also it's going to be a demonstration It's that it is a heroic age and era because this benefits many patients with a diabetes type 1. Joanna, thank you very much, Professor. Good evening. For me, it's a pleasure being here and sharing this evening to you. I wanted to thank for your invitation to Arturo and Laureano. I think we cannot start without uh, referring to diabetes. That according to our recent data of the WHO, diabetes is a major cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart attacks, stroke, and lower limb amputation. In 2019, diabetes was considered the ninth leading cause of death with an estimated 1.5 million deaths directly caused by diabetes. And diabetes can be treated, this is important, and its consequences can be avoided or can be delayed. We do celebrate 100 years of the discovery of insulin in 1921. And this discovery gave us the opportunity to treat diabetes and also transformed this deadly disease to a more chronic condition. We can see here nowadays all of the advancements that we have had with the insulin, new sensors, new, new pumps, and we have been able to control this in a medicine way. But the control of prevention of the target organs has not been achieved. And the first pancreas transplantation, as you can see here, was done in December 1966 in the University of Minnesota by Lilehe and Kelly. And they were the ones that marked all of the journey of standard of care of treatment of diabetes, like the transplant of pancreas. We know that the hyperglycemia causes a very important damage, a chronic damage, and this is manifested by the diabetes in a macrovascular disease, in kidney diseases, and in a macrovascular way, but most important, that the last articles show that the most important thing is to have a strict control of glycemia because we can reduce this way all of the cardiovascular diseases that are the main cause of death. When we talk about the diabetes type 1, we talk about two types. First is the medical treatment and the surgical treatment. We do now apply a treatment with a step-by-step -step focus and a tailored depending on each patient. We do have new formulations of insulin. And we must have in mind that these are not available for every patient and they do have a very high cost. In second place, we do have the beta cell replacement and also based on therapies such as the pancreas transplant. So why do we consider the pancreas transplantation as a standard of care now? Because it is the best treatment to achieve the best glycemic control, and we try to avoid not only hyperglycemia, which is the complications of diabetes, but also hypoglycemia, which consequences are very dramatic in the healthcare budgets of every country and also in the daily life of people living with diabetes and also of its relative and loved ones. As Frederick Banting said that insulin is not the cure of diabetes, just a treatment. So the balance goes to the pancreas transplantation, which is the best long-term outcomes with regard to insulin independence. And this is in the transplant of large beta cell mass. It's also because of the metabolic controls, because it prevents hypoglycemia and also restores the normal glycemia. 
And as we have always known, we must do a balance of the risk and benefits to do a tailored treatment for each patient and also taking into account the different agents. We see here the different types of treatment and types of pancreas transplants. The most used is the simultaneous transplant or pancreas kidney which is advised for the type 1 and also for some kidney issues in which they are um, undergoing some dialysis. And we have also demonstrated in literature that the results on the long term are even better when we do this pancreas simultaneously with the kidney. We can also offer a pancreas transplant after a kidney transplant from an alive or a dead donor and also least frequent to those who have severe hypoglycemia and normal renal function, we can offer the pancreas transplant itself alone. So the benefit of this kidney pancreas transplant has been already shown. Steve White, James Shaw and Sutherland published the benefits of this simultaneous transplant compared to those who were on the waiting list which survival will dropped to 46 percent we only not obtain benefits at the long term but the most important thing that offers is that stabilizes the metabolic controls it improves the polyneuropathy prevents the recurrence of nephropathy it also appears to stabilize retinopathy, improves cardiovascular disease outcomes, and improves also quality of life. So when we improve quality of life of these people, this is basically what we want. So in the year 83, in the clinic Barcelona, we did the first pancreas transplant led by a Fernandez Cruz professor. There are some surgical risks in this sense. We have some thrombosis, but we must say that now, thanks to these new advances, to the new technologies and the, also the precisions of the phenomenon, this uh, is less, these risks are less, but there is also a group of patients that due to technical reasons it is not indicated the transplant maybe because they have a very important vascular disease and then what happens in the world in the world related to this brown crust transplantations we have this publishing from 2019 last 20 years annually in the United States, we have around 1,000 transplants of pancreas, and in the United Kingdom, between 300 and 500 per year. And in Spain, we have some recent numbers of the Spanish National Transplant Organization. We see how the number um, increased until 2004, and it has been changing afterwards. And we must highlight and that in Spain, there's a group that has thus child pancreas transplant, another group that does in adults. And the clinic Barcelona is the one that leads this number of transplants. And what is the evidence of this over the results? related to the survival of the patients are the results of the last 20 years. In Barcelona, you can see that the survival of five years, it's around 95.7%. After 10 years, it's 92.9%. So these results are even better than the ones published by other groups. This happens, this is, happens the same with the pancreatic tissue transplants. So we talked about a, this hypoglucemic control. So the survival of the graft, it's around 80%. So these are even better results than other global investigations. So we had also the first world consensus in PISA. These are some European representatives lead, led by Fernandez Cruz professors. And we had a panel of experts that led the most important recommendations according to the pancreas transplants. And the main 
recommendation was the simultaneous transplantation kidney pancreas that was indicated in patients with diabetes number one and also kidney failure because it improved the life expectancy and also the quality of life. And this is shown in all of the public published guidelines. This is one published recently. And here we see the role of the simultaneous pancreas and kidney in the indication of this, on the treatment for this kind of patients. So to wrap up, I wanted to say that despite the continuous advancements in continuous insulin therapy, there are still many diabetic patient, patients that are still unable to achieve optimal and consistent glycemic control, that the pancreas transplantation is the only way to replace the beta cells and control uh, the glucose homeostasis. And we must bear in mind that different therapies may be offered to patients at different stages of their diabetes course, always having in mind the clinical context and also basing ourselves in the risk benefit. Thank you very much.